Go for it. Off you go. Brilliant. So my name is Leah, third time, third time, third year part-time PhD student at the University of Nottingham. And today my presentation is about an intersectional approach to Cuban labor histories dealing with the 1930s. So this is the structure of my presentation this evening. I will briefly introduce to say how this paper is relevant to my research. Then the main section uses three examples to demonstrate how intersectionality is a useful approach to understand 1930s Cuban labor histories. Sorry, and after can you move your slides on on the left? Oh. Click on the left and that's it. There we go. Oh, is it showing up now? Yeah, and you have to control, keep controlling it like that. Ah, uh, okay. So if I do that, you all can see that. Brilliant. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you so much. So my PhD research is multidisciplinary. I'm investigating the historical experiences of Cuban laborers and immigrant laborers in 1930s Cuba through popular culture. Currently, I'm researching what was considered popular in the decade. By that, I mean what was produced, what was engaged with, and what was consumed. And some popular sources I'm looking at include some revistas, revistas, journals, and los muñecos, or uh, graphic humor. So to understand why cultural sources were popular among certain groups of people in Cuban society, it is necessary to first explain the historical context or understand it at least. So for this reason, the paper that I'm presenting today is based on a literature review that I recently conducted about 1930s Cuban labor histories, which revealed that the lives of laborers in Cuba and of the individuals in society at large were dynamic and complex. Rather than ignore these complexities, I decided to consider the approach of intersectionality. The main question asks today, how is intersectionality a relevant approach to 1930s Cuban labor histories? What is intersectionality? So in brief, intersectionality is an analytical framework coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. It describes how individual categories of identity overlap and therefore intersect with each other. Intersectionality invites considerations of how different forms of oppression operate at the same time and therefore cannot be examined separately from one another. Because human lives are complex and individuals can belong to several identity groups at once, the lived experiences of human beings can be described as intersectional. I will now turn to my first example. So Cuban labor scholarship reveals the following major themes, tensions between Cuban laborers and foreign laborers, economic vulnerability for laborers due to job insecurity and low wages, and a rich history of migration between Cuba and other Caribbean islands. There are other themes, but I'm just focusing on those three for today. In looking at the Caribbean connection to the Cuban labor scene, the term antianos was used to refer to Caribbean workers who were part of the workforce that was used on sugar estates and plantations of tropical fruit companies. 1930s documentation of Caribbean laborers, so this is some of the primary sources, they tended to generalize antianos as either Haitian, Jamaican, or British West Indian. However, the presence of Caribbean laborers from across the Caribbean region is evidenced by a 1946 report that looked at laborers, Caribbean laborers in Oriente and Camagüey, which documented them from numerous Caribbean islands, including Dominica, Montserrat, St. Lucia, and Nevis. Furthermore, some Cuban labor histories have studied the histories of black laborers in Cuba through the lens of race alone. Their justification is that black laborers shared common experiences, the economic exploitation as laborers, and also racial discrimination as individuals of black ethnicity. However, McLeod 1998 encouraged Cuban labor scholars not to lump all black workers together in their analyses. Rather, researchers must consider the national and ethnic identities which distinguish different groups of people 
within the African diaspora from one another. Therefore, using the intersectionality of race, ethnicity and class, I can provide a richer context to the different experiences within each migrant labourer group in Cuba. Now, this is by no means an attempt to detail every experience, but rather to recognise that relation dy relationship dynamics among labourers as a social group were complex. Foreign labourers in Cuba hailed from distinct socio-cultural and national backgrounds, and intersectionality creates a space for the understanding and the discussion of different worker experiences within and across social groups. My second example highlights the tensions between Cuban laborers and foreign laborers as the intersectionality of labor and race. In the 1930s, ongoing debates about nationality and redefinitions of Cubania came into question at all levels of society amidst a desire to rid Cuba of the stronghold of the United States. Cuban laborers closed ranks against foreign workers and in 1990, 1933, sorry, the 50% law was passed amidst political conflict. This occurred after Cuban workers made demands to give quote unquote native Cubans job preferences over foreign workers. The 50% law amplified economic and cultural nationalism through its quota, which stipulated that at least half of all jobs in agriculture, commerce and industry should be reserved for native Cubans. Yet, these public debates about foreignness, about who does or does not belong in Cuba, also brought racist characterizations of black Cubans by the Cuban elite to the 1930s forefront. Black Cuban laborers and members of the black Cuban elite expressed their displeasure at the racist language used in the press. The 1930s, 30, 30, very many 30, sorry. The 1933 labor unrest was used as an occasion to scapegoat black Antianos as disorderly troublemakers and marking black migrants to Cuba as quote unquote racial and ethnic others brought to the fore how the presence of black foreigners on Cuban soil disrupted the ideal of those individuals who envision, envisioned Cuba as a white Hispanic nation. This example of tensions within the laboring class in Cuba, which took place amidst national conversations of identity, reveal numerous intersections of race, class, Cubania, anti-imperialism and the nation. The final example speaks to the intersections of race, class, gender and Cubania. Intersectionality encourages researchers to look at the experiences of individuals and of groups who sit, in the mar sit on the margins. In looking at feminist activism in Cuba, specifically by Cuban elite and middle-class women, the experiences of laboring women and of black, la black Cuban laboring women were generally omitted from national feminist discussions until the 1930s. Articles written by Ophelia Costa in a weekly comment, column in the Bohemia magazine that was actually dedicated to women's struggles, she also combined and included labour issues of the day. One example of that was the exploitation of seamstresses by sweatshops and fashion houses. Also, women from the Federación de Sociedades Negras published a manifesto in 1939 which addressed the need for constitutional reform. Their manifesto also contended that Cubans did not achieve the Cubania principles of racelessness because Cuban society practiced anti-black racism, which seeped into every facet of daily life for individuals of African descent. In addition, the involvement of black women in the third National Women's Congress of 1939 disrupted the tradition of only elite white women organizing and attending large feminist congresses. The strategic contribution of black laboring and poor Cuban women to the third Congress 
drew national attention to wider social issues. And these issues included access to healthcare, fair working conditions, and the political representation of women. This Congress in particular was hailed as a turning point for both the Cuban feminist movement and the Cuban labor movement. It aimed to unify women across racial and class lines. It also aimed to advocate for social equality and also address racial inequalities on a national level. This example shows how the intersections of class and gender can identify the need for an analysis of race, which also speaks to the practice of intersectionality. And that is actively looking for and including the experiences of individuals or groups who sit on the margins. In conclusion, researching Cuban labor histories through the lens of intersectionality is just one way to embrace the complexity of human lives. The examples used in this presentation show that the 1930s was a decade with layered histories that cannot be fully understood in a linear way. An intersectional approach, therefore, enables my research to visualize the layered experiences of Cubas, of Cubas, of laborers, sorry, in 1930s Cuba and their interactions with other social groups against interrelated socio-political changes. Using this historical context to explain the intricacies in laborer experiences will prove invaluable to situate the popular culture sources that I will investigate. In reflection, I have to look for popular sources, popular culture sources, which can reveal aspects of everyday lives from Havana as well as from outside Havana. By doing so, my study will contribute to Cuban labor history that localizes rather than generalizes labor experiences. On this point, I would appreciate any recommendations for 1930s revistas, newspapers or journals, especially outside of Havana to help with this aspect of my study. Finally, to research the intersectional labor histories of 1930s Cuba is an intentional approach which prevents the retelling of a single story. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Well done. That really was interesting. It really was. You've got it. You've really got it. And I really look forward to hearing the results of your the, the research that you take from there because you're just you've just got it right. Brilliant. And Munch, the cat, also <laughs> liked that. Incidentally, he started making a noise as you finished. So thanks, Munch. <laughs> Right, lovely. Thank you very much, Leah. And we'll leave the questions again till the end and move straight on to the last one and probably the most patient of all people now, Arturo Hernandez. Arturo, are you there? I am. Great. Could you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Do you have any PowerPoints or anything like that? Yeah, could you guys see me or no? Oh, I can there see we go. you yes, now, yes. Can. How are you guys? <laughs> I know, we're fine. Right, so I'm going to just jump right into it because obviously everyone's tired and they're trying to go. Yeah, but um, I've, I've got I've pulled myself a beer now, so I'm all right, okay? No, no, you're good. We're good then. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, sure. Do you need to talk him through it? No, nope, now we can see it. So uh, you you may take the easy route and just click on the left on your list of slides yeah. rather than do slideshow. But we can, yeah, that'll we can be see it and we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. It's moving. Over to you, Arturo. Okay. Uh really quick. I just finished um I just finished doing my uh submitting my dissertation. And so this presentation is gonna be um effectively the, the most uh striking portions of my dissertation, but Obviously, the, the dissertation itself goes into greater detail as to all of these things. Um, this presentation focuses on a, one particular aspect of my dissertation, which is the doctrine of deconstitutionalization and what the implications are uh, to the Cuban legal and political systems as a result of the adoption of deconstitutionalization by the Cuban Supreme Court. Um, and then lastly, uh, because of the time limitations, as it's only 15 minutes, there's going to be a lot of generalities 
um, and you know, just just uh, basically glossing over a lot of stuff. So if anyone is familiar with Cuban law or law in general, uh, I apologize for that. But 15 minutes doesn't give me much time. So with that, um, I'm going to start. So basically, the doctrine of deconstitutionalization uh, could be traced. The origin of it could be traced to uh, most uh, pertinently to 1898 when the Americans uh, come in and uh, basically run Cuba as a military government. So once the Americans come in and are running the government of Cuba, a couple of things happen. Uh, obviously, number one is that they control the entire governmental and legal system of the country. Um, number two is that they adopt, because they don't have time to create new legal codes, they uh, adopt the, the Spanish civil codes and uh, procedural codes um, which were in power in Cuba prior to them taking over, right? But they adopt them, so basically pushing them, pushing the uh, the uh, application of those laws into the future. And then the third thing is the introduction of certain aspects of Anglo-American common law into the Cuban civil law system, right? So, for example, uh, ideas of due process, the institution of habeas corpus, uh, jury trials, et cetera, et cetera, right? So. They, they come in and the, the things that, that work for them, they create the, uh, the Spanish legal codes and for the things that they don't find convenient or that they find too unfamiliar or that they feel that they, they can improve upon, they introduce common law elements um, such as the ones I previously mentioned into the legal system in order to, you know, quote unquote, improve it, right? So as part of this effort, they introduced the uh, the Cuban Supreme Court in 1898, and the the Cuban Supreme Court um, is modeled after the American Supreme Court naturally, and it's like the American Supreme Court. It's envisioned as the final arbiter and interpreter of Cuban law. Um, that is the final authority on what Cuban law actually is, um, because it is modeled on the American court, and because uh, the Supreme Court at this time within written constitutional systems is very much the product of an Anglo-American common law system. The court has the power to create law through the adoption of opinions, um, which are known as legal precedent. And in, in, in common law, in the common law world, it's, it's, it's known as jurisprudence, right? Jurisprudence is a set of judicial decisions that serve as a source of law or rights, right? So over time, when an institution like a Supreme Court renders decisions, uh, that comes to create jurisprudence, um, which is equal to uh, law. Unlike this is in, in, um, in contrast to civil law systems where within civil law systems, the only source of law are codes issued by the legislature, right? So when the Americans come in, they introduce this, this um, concept and the concept that the Supreme Court has the power to make law or to find law through their interpretation of laws and through the issuance of opinions. Um, yeah, as, as I, oh, it's important to, to note that within common law systems, judicial precedent is a source of law. That is, it is equal to law itself uh, or superior to in certain cases, right? Um, this was very different to the experience that the experiences that the Cubans were used to um, under the Spanish monarchy and under the various Spanish republics, whereby the law was created by the legislature, by the king. Um, and there was no power of the judiciary to create law, to interpret law, or to impose the meaning of a given uh, legal instrument upon um, something that was written by the legislature. And that tradition dates back to the effectively the founding of the civil law tradition through the Roman law and also through its subsequent reinterpretations, particularly by the uh, French civil law um, following the French Revolution, right? So th through the establishment of this of jurisprudence and the adoption of, of uh, jurisprudence, the Cubans effectively have a new tool to create law, right? Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, this the the, the uh, decisions by the by the court represented the ultimate judicial authority, and uh, its rulings and interpretation of the law and government actions are binding on the coordinate branches of the government, right? So the executive 
branch and the legislative branch of the Cuban government uh, as later established through the constitution of 1901 are bound by the interpretations and decisions of the Cuban Supreme Court. And those decisions that the Supreme Court renders uh, have equal status with the law and are actually law. They are actually law in fact. Um, and so that's that's effectively the, the kind of system that's established by the American military government and then later codified and entrenched within the constitution of 1901, right? And so pursuant to the, to the doctrine of judicial review, right? Um, or what I just previously mentioned, um, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. And this quote is from a case, the case which established judicial review in the United States, and the case is Marbury versus Madison, um, which is attributed with creating um, judicial review as we know it, right? And so what is judicial review? Uh, pursuant to the aforementioned power, judicial review is the power of the courts of a country to examine the actions of the legislative, executive, and administrative arms of the government to determine whether such actions are consistent with the Constitution. If those actions are consistent with the Constitution, then the court will render an opinion stating that the government is, is able to do whatever it is that they want it to do. If, if the actions of the government or of if, if legislation is unconstitutional, then the court will render a decision basically stating that the actions or the legislation is unconstitutional and therefore the court, sorry, the branches of the government are enjoined from pursuing a given action or entrenching uh, a given law or applying it to a, a particular individual, right? So the, the decisions of the Supreme Court as regards this are supreme and um, official and indisputable. Um, they are the ultimate authority as to the law within the system that's created in Cuba um, pursuant to after 1901, right? As I mentioned, the, the court may invalidate laws. In their, in their exercise of judicial review, the government may invalidate laws uh, or government actions that are incompatible with the Constitution. Um, of, like I said, it, it will be binding. Um, another quick historical kind of aside is that in Cuba, unlike in the United States, the power of judicial review was written into the Constitution of 1901, um, whereas in the United States, it's adopted. The process of judicial review is adopted through um, the adoption of case president itself, right? Um, now, as I previously alluded to, the these institutions, uh, these common law institutions that were uh, implemented in Cuba were unfamiliar to a lawyer and to a, to a judge uh, trained in the civil law tradition. Moreover, the, the institution of judicial review as it was practiced in Cuba and the United States was at that point in time was not a, a hugely significant part of the legal practice or constitutional practice throughout the world. That is, it was the process of judicial review was still very much in its infancy. Very few nations of the world at that point in time had adopted an institution that permitted the judiciary to invalidate laws created by the legislature or actions of the executive. So what that led to was a, a Cuban judiciary, which was very reluctant to utilize the power that they had because they believed it to be a, a usurpation of the sovereignty of the people through the legislature and through their elected executive, right? And so that manifested itself early on uh, within the practices of the Cuban Supreme Court uh, for the, you know, for these reasons, right? So that, as I mentioned, the civil law, the judiciary was trained in the civil law. They weren't familiar with common law, with precedent, with um, issuing decisions that would overturn um, the laws. There was also an idea that they were reluctant to encroach on the legislative supremacy which was very much a part of the historical practice within civil law systems. And then there, um, as I mentioned, the, the lack of governmental societal familiarity. And then the last thing is a more kind of perhaps a cynical or practical um, consideration. And that is that unlike in the United States where the justices of the Supreme Court are um, have life tenure, in Cuba, the system 
the Constitution did not allow them or did not permit them uh, or create that life tenure system. So judges had to think very carefully about the way that they were rendering decisions and the extent of the decisions that they were rendering um, so as not to face professional and personal consequences. Um, and unfortunately, because of Cuba's history is the way that it is, in certain occasions, judges had to fear for their life. And that's very much uh, a, a consideration still in many countries in Latin America, unfortunately. Right. So those those were kind of the issues that the court that a young Cuban Supreme Court was facing early on in, in its existence. Right. And everything was more or less OK with regard to the law and the judiciary up until the presidency of Gerardo Machado. Right. So in uh, in 1928, Machado, with the backing of the legislature, effectively decreed a two year extension of his presidency and unconstitutionally altered the Constitution in order for his reelection uh, to the presidency of Cuba. Now, when I say unconstitutionally altered the Constitution, what I mean is that the process is delineated within the 1901 Constitution to alter or to amend that Constitution were not followed by Gerardo Machado or the legislature um in in amending it unfortunately for many reasons the supreme court uh decided that 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 process that they had utilized was permissible or that alternatively um the process that that was utilized to try and uh, adjudicate the impropriety of those changes um was itself uh non-permissible and therefore those changes could not be scrutinized. And so in effect, Machado was, you could say that he was successful in unconstitutionally amending the constitution of uh, 1901. Now we all know what happened as a result of that, right? Eventually led to the revolution of 1933, which removed Machado from power on August 12, 1933, right? So this led to, as we know, um, a litany of changes with regard to the personnel of the government, what the government was doing, who was in charge, but most importantly, it led to the sorry the um, dissolution of the Constitution of 1901 and 1934 under under Grau, right? Um, and that that the decision to um, dissolve the Constitution of 1901 was uh, multifaceted, and a lot of a lot of things went into that, um, particularly the the uh the the then existing continuance of the Platt amendment right that had a huge uh factor in um determining that the 1901 constitution should be um dissolved right so now arturo hey, five yeah. minutes okay thanks tony so now as a result of that dissolution of the government we have what is effectively uh, a revolutionary government in control right in attempting to govern the nation without a constitution, uh, Grau institutes what, what he calls provisional statutes, right? Um, which come to replace the constitution of 1901 and which come to form the basis of the revolutionary government hence, henceforth, right? Naturally, because it is a revolutionary government, all of the decisions that the government is making is are inconsistent with the previous constitution and are made in an ad hoc manner. That is whatever the revolution needs at that particular time is what it legislates for through decree. There is no um, legislative process as is commonly understood. There is no um, executive oversights as are commonly understood. And so the revolutionary government does things as needed, right? Naturally, that leads to um, a lot of problems with regard to challenges from um, people, citizens, challenging the legality of this government's actions, uh, particularly by saying that the actions of this government are, in are uh, inconsistent with the Constitution of 1901, which despite the, which, uh, despite the decreed dissolution uh, by Grau, people still believed, some people still believed the Constitution of 1901 to be the legally governing constitution of of the island and therefore by uh legislating against that constitution the argument was that the government the revolutionary government was act itself acting unconstitutionally right now the supreme court when adjudicating these challenges had a very difficult situation on their hands because if they invalidated the legality of the revolutionary government's actions there would effectively be no government um, 
at, at best, it would lead to a more difficult situation than already existed, right? But conversely, by failing to scrutinize the unconstitutional origin and practices of the government, the court would open the door to future unconstitutional usurpation. Um, and this is true because of the court's adoption of the doctrine of deconstitutionalization, right? And so effectively, one of these legal challenges results in the court having to decide whether the dissolution of the Constitution of 1901 and the subsequent laws enacted by the revolutionary government should be considered legal or not legal. And what should be the legal consequences of that dissolution and, and entrenchment of, of a new legal system. And that led to the issuance of this opinion uh, on March 1st, 1934, which was the opinion that created or uh, not created, uh, adopted the, um, the doctrine of deconstitutionalization, which would have subsequent effects, huge subsequent effects on uh, the Cuban government, right? So the court opinion says, in constitutional law, revolution results in a state of being which is not governed by the previous law. Rather, revolution displaces it and comes to create a new law, which is precisely its justification, independently and abstractly from the constitution, which was in force on the date of its victory, according to whose norm it would not be so achieved through revolutionary measures. Since all violent political change takes place outside of those norms and in a manner that is essentially incompatible with the subsistence of the previous legal regime. The overthrow of the then existing government in Cuba on August 12, 1933, the dissolution of the Congress, the repeal of the constitutional reforms, and the partial reestablishment of the first fundamental charter, uh, which was decreed, decreed by revolutionary executive, in conjunction with the suppression of that power by a second rebellion, which in turn made the reestablished constitution dissolve by instituting a de facto government composed of commissioners, uh, the, the, the constituent statutes of basic rights and creating new administrative, political, and judicial bodies are facts which legally and materially preclude the previous constitutional regime from exercising any operative force. This is true because the continued application of the previous constitutional arrangement necessarily implies the non-existent of the current government and the laws which are by the same dictated which would not be legally applicable by the courts as such laws have not been promulgated as ordered by the preceding constitution, as well as uh, of all political and social acts which precipitated the changes and which furthermore are a necessary product of the process which has resulted in the crystallization of the, pol of the present political state. So in effect, what the, court, what the court is saying is that by perpetration of a successful rev revolution, which the people have called for, for desired and subsequently adopted um, through the success of that process the previous constitution is dissolved all of the limitations upon the issuance of legislation or the the delimitations of power are wiped away with the successful entrenchment uh, of a revolutionary government additionally that revolutionary government because of the process of deconstitutionalization um, is permitted to establish their own constitution, their own laws, and their own uh, government as a result of that success. Now, unfortunately, what this uh, meant for the future of Cuban legal and political practice was that anyone who could successfully perpetrate a quote-unquote revolution within Cuba um, had the legal justification because of the Supreme Court's uh, stature as the ultimate interpreter of Cuban law, as previously mentioned, um, these persons, whoever it happened to be, if they successfully perpetrated a revolution within Cuba or what they asserted to be a revolution, they could then create their own laws and d dissolve the previous constitution and they would be legally justified in doing so. And so this is precisely what occurred in 1952 um, and the court said as much in the legal challenges to the constitutionality of the Batista government of 1952 and also what happened in 1959. Um, and the courts basically allowed um, these changes to the Cuban government, despite the fact that they were unconstitutional, uh, based on the, uh, the, the, the court's previous adoption of the doctrine of deconstitutionalization and the experiences of deconstitutionalization um and those 
that doctrine therefore has uh, manifested itself uh, with extreme um, results and has significantly altered the trajectory and the practice of Q of the Cuban legal, governmental, and political systems of since the day of its adoption in 1934. And that's basically uh, just a little tiny piece of my findings. <laughs> Thank you very much, Arturo. Maybe a tiny piece, but actually its implications are vast. I have to say that Arturo has the, had the success of actually explaining to me, after all these years, precisely why Fidel Castro actually decided that he, is, he could argue that his revolution was legal. Because I could never understand it. Now I do. So thank you, Arturo. Thanks, Arturo. Right, we've now got um, 10 minutes for questions for the last three papers and also for Margaret, Margaret Brecheny, who didn't have the time for questions afterwards. So I open up the floor to anybody who is still there and still with us to come up with questions because we really had some superb papers. All of the papers were just great. Over to you, folks. Arturo, I think you've beaten them into submission. <laughs> I, it is... Uh, yeah, uh, Albert, please, come in. Yeah, well, thank you so much uh, for these brilliant papers. Um, uh, to Leah, well, a very interesting paper. Um, I, I was thinking about uh, the... Mm, complexity and par paradoxy of uh, the 1930s being at the same time the time of the first Batistato and the first Cuban president who was non-white um, and at the same time you know this uh, re repression and 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 also uh, some window of, of opportunity for uh, specific activism towards the end of the 1930s specifically so I would be really interested in and how these, uh, how you would um, interpret uh, these, uh, let's say, strange interactions between, on the one hand, you know, uh, until 1935, 37, this very repressive regime, and then in 1937 and forward, uh, onwards, this, this uh, opening. What what effect did it have on the Afro-Cuban community, particularly on women? Mm. And then a very short question for Arturo. Um, so this is, uh, I think your last slide um, uh, contains a very contentious claim that, and you put it, I think, in, in how do you say, entre comillas, um, a revolution. So what is revolution, right? Uh, I think uh, very clearly Fidel Castro and other revolutionaries questioned, of course, uh, heavily that Batista's coup was could be termed as a coined as a revolution, but of course Batista said it was a revolution. So that would be interesting to me. Who um, legally would actually define what is a successful revolution, and then subsequently uh, would uh, would legalize um, the deconstitutionalization what would follow, right, and the new laws. So that would be a really an interesting discussion. Thank you. Should I? Okay. Uh, yep. Should I go first? Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So in terms of contextualizing the points and situations you mentioned, it all depends on the sources that I find. And so what I've been finding, especially with the cultural literature review, is that I have to take into account what cultural source type I'm talking about, whether it's a journal or a vista the year that it was published, who uh, who was the association publishing it or who were the editors. So to find out what the voices or the identity, identity, excuse me, long evening, what the social group of the people publishing the particular source was, find out whether the, the opinions or the pieces reflected in the source actually reflected common beliefs or common ideals among that social group 
and then contextualize it that way. So I'm interested to know as well. And it all depends on the sources. It's Thank you. Simple. With with regard to your question, yeah, I, I think um, I actually had a presentation on the the legal implications of the word revolution, right? A couple of months ago, because that was that was another kind of aspect which I, I stumbled upon. But effectively, the conclusion of that presentation or of that particular segment is that the term revolution is legally dispositive in Cuba, which mean which you alluded to which means that for the purposes of establishing constitutionality, the word revolution matters. That is, the court has to adjudicate what the word revolution means in order to then adjudicate whether a given extra constitutional action is uh, constitutional or could be found to be constitutional. And with regard to that, in 1952, on based on the challenges to uh, the coup of 1952, Batista was asserting himself through his counsel, of course, within the Supreme Court, um, that his coup was in fact a revolution and therefore that he was legally justified in carrying out that action, right? Um, on the flip side, the the respondents, the the I'm sorry, the petitioners to that to those actions were saying, yes, this is true. The court has said on previous occasions that a revolution, a successful revolution has the legal right to establish themselves and to create a new government. But what happened here was not a revolution, but rather a coup. What has changed is effectively the personnel on top of a given structure and the uh, very uh, insidiously the manner in which that government is carried out. But in insofar as there are changes to the fundamental uh, legal and political and ideological structure of the nation these things haven't changed and therefore what he did was not what he perpetrated was not a revolution but rather a coup and as a result of that not legally justified in establishing a new government and therefore this court should find that that his uh, government is unconstitutional and therefore you know perpetrate some form of legal retribution right and these were the arguments that were made before the court in 1952 Interestingly, uh, moving on to Fidel Castro, right? Fidel Castro recognizes the importance of the word revolution and the legal implications of utilizing that term um, during his movement, right? So it's not a movement. It's not a coup. It's not a, a any anything else other than a revolution. And the reason why that word is used is because he understands as a lawyer that it matters, right? And so in Lectoria Mabsobera, he makes the point Um a, a successful revolution is not what, or sorry, a revolution is not what Batista did, but rather it is changes to the legal political system. It is changes to the government. It is actual substantive changes to rights and to retribution and to all of these things. And he's making that point and telling the court, listen, what, what Batista did was not a revolution, effectively repeating the same arguments that were made in 1952, but putting his own personal spin on what it means to him to be to actually be a revolution, right? And so he makes that argument, obviously. Batista was successful in making the argument that his was a revolution, right? Uh, and then subsequently, Castro was successful in making that same argument. Um, he made his argument preemptively in Historia Mabsobera, right? Which subsequently the court adopts on January uh, 1st, 1959, uh, during that time, when a new provisional government is trying to be established by the previous um, the previous uh, organization of Batista, despite the fact that Batista led the, left the country, he left what he thought would be a provisional president. And the 26th of July movement is coming into Havana. And the, the provisional government that Batista envisioned goes to the Supreme Court to say, um, I need you to... to uh, swear us in as the the government of cuba and the supreme court says we're very sorry but there's a person named fidel castro in charge of a provisional revolution that has successfully taken over cuba and therefore he is now the legal governor of cuba and 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 the any provisional government is now dissolved and he's legally justified him and his movement are legally justified in creating their own laws and establishing their own things. So the word revolution and the doctrine of deconstitutionalization is very much tied to the legality of both 
or illegality of both the Batista coup and of the revolution of 1959. I'm sorry if that was a long answer, but. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it is interesting. One of the things I think we're probably reaching the end of, end of time, um, but one of the things that really actually joins the four of you together, really quite interestingly, is this notion that Leah came up with about intersectionality, but it's not just about the question of race, gender, and um, what was the other one? Uh, class. class, that's right. It's not just about that. It is all about the fact that, as you picked up, uh, Albert, you've got the question mm -hmm. of the different pressures coming towards the Chinese community and from the Chinese community to create a huge complex. So you can't predict what's going to happen. You can't actually at the time say this causes that, that causes that. Uh, and Margaret came up with the same thing as well. That you've got these people being described as one thing, but actually there may be something else, depending on how you define these people. And then Arturo comes up with different, const different legal systems coming together chaotically after 1901. And you think, well, actually, is it European law? Is it Roman law? Is it Spanish? Is it Amer American? Is it Cuban? What is it? And the net result is you end up with what you've got, which is Cuba after 1901 or Cuba after whenever it is. And I think that's one thing that came across with all four of you is it is a damn sight more complex than anybody thinks at any one time. Mm. So thank you for that. And I think on that note, uh, anybody who wasn't here for Reynaldo's uh, keynote yesterday, his keynote really, I mean, it was just a tour de force. It gives you an impression of the complexity mm. of one type of history, in his case, looking at food, looking at environmental history. Um, but all of your presentations today have given that same impression of the complexity of history and how... Uh, you know, how those layers that Leah was talking about are so important. So thank you all. I think we're all ready for Absolutely. a drink. Absolutely. Go and, to eat. Go and have a drink, please. That's an instruction for you as well, Arturo. Go and have a drink, okay? Yeah, this is not meant to be some sort of uh, extreme challenge, but it's turning into one. So hopefully tomorrow it'll be a bit less extreme. Like I said, if anybody feels that they didn't have the justice of the time or would like to record their presentation. We're sharing everything. But it, once again, it's been ooh, a very intense day, but a really, really interesting yeah. day for all and, of us. And Margaret, you will get people following up on your information and your uh, resource information there without absolutely. any doubt. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I will send um, a recording of it. That would be absolutely Lovely. fantastic because it's so fascinating. Yeah. All of you, thank you so much. Then thanks we'll to all see, of you for the patience. We'll see the brave tomorrow at one o'clock for day three, right? <laughs> day three. Uh, um, hasta mañana. Yeah, Gracias hasta mañana. a todos. Thanks very much. Hasta luego. Gracias. Hasta mañana. Right. Thank you. Gracias. Ciao. Well, that was good.